All right, I'm going to start part two by reading a children's book. And I do this frequently throughout the course. Children book, children's books are fantastic because it gets to the essence, and I'm using that word on purpose here, gets to the essence of some really deep ideas frequently, right? Because they're trying to convey to children, hey, here's the main idea here. Hey, here's the main thing here, right? Aesop's fables, short little stories that teach a lesson or a moral. And Shrapi at least thinks most children's stories are still trying to teach some type of something. So, and this is going to bring up, I think, the distinction, the contrast between essential properties and accidental properties, or essential qualities and accidental qualities, which our excerpt gets into page 78, 79, somewhere around there. But a children's book may be an easier way to get into it here. The Important Book. This is from the same author uh, as uh, Good Night Moon, Margaret Wise Brown. The important thing, I'll get a little bit closer here. The important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. It's like a little shovel. You hold it in your hand, you can put it in your mouth. It isn't flat, it's hollow. And it spoons things up, but the important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. The important thing about a daisy is that it is white. It is yellow in the middle, it has long white petals and bees sit on it. It has a ticklish smell, it grows in green fields, and there are always lots of daisies, but the important thing about a daisy is that it is white. The important thing about rain is that it is wet. It falls out of the sky and it sounds like rain and makes things shiny. It does not taste like anything and it's the color of air. But the important thing about rain is that it is wet. The important thing about grass is that it is green. It grows and is tender with a sweet grassy smell. The important thing about grass is that it is green. The important thing about snow is that it is white. It's cold and light. It falls softly out of the sky. It's bright in the shape of tiny stars and crystals. It's always cold and it melts. But the important thing about snow is that it is white. The important thing about an apple is that it is round. It's red, you bite it, and it's white inside, and the juice splashes in your face, and it tastes like an apple, and it falls off a tree. But the important thing about an apple is that it is round. The important thing about the wind is that it blows. You can't see it, but you can feel it on your cheek, and see how it bends trees, and blows hats away, and sails boats. But the important thing about the wind is that it blows. The important thing about the sky is that it's always there. It's true that it's blue and high and full of clouds and made of air, but the important thing about the sky is that it is always there. The important thing about a shoe is that you put your foot in it. You walk in it and you take it off at night and it's warm when you take it off, but the important thing about a shoe is that you put your foot in it. The important thing about you is that you are you. It's true that you were a baby and you grew and now you're a child and you will grow into a man or into a woman. But the important thing about you is that you are you. Hmm. Now, what I think is really awesome about this book is the way it ends with the subject, just like Aristotle would, right? The important thing about you is that you're you. Notice, Margaret Wise Brown doesn't get into what it is that defines you. And that'll be a journal probably in a couple of weeks. Who are you? What are the essential characteristics that make you you? What are the things that if they were different, you would be someone different? And if you were someone different, you'd probably require a name change. Back to the names again. Back to Ship of Theseus again. What are the essential qualities of that boat such that if they change, you got to change the name because you got something different, Right? But I also think it's interesting because in this book, the important book, she has a really nice job. There are some things that we think the essential thing, the important thing about it is the way that it functions. Other things, the important thing, the essential thing is the way that it looks. So, for example, she says the important thing about an apple is that it's round. 
You can have a green apple. You can have a red apple. Heck, you can probably have a blue apple, orange apple. I don't know. You probably still recognize it as an apple. It would still fall under the classification of apple, regardless of color. And apples, of course, taste differently as well, right? There are some very bitter apples. There are very sweet apples. There are apples that are good for cooking. There are good apples for cider, right? So apples taste differently, yet we classify them all as apple. She says it's about the shape. It's round. So if I were to give you something that tasted like an apple, was red, came off of a tree, but was triangle shaped, would you classify it as apple? Margaret Wise Brown wouldn't. It's not round. It doesn't meet the most fundamental criteria of applehood. But that's just Margaret Wise Brown's essential idea of apple. Here, here's, here's another question. Here's a deep philosophical question that doesn't seem like it. That book I just read to you, the important book, is that a work of fiction or nonfiction? I mean, if you want to say it's nonfiction, then you have to claim that everything she says in there is true, right? Which means then that you agree. The important thing about a shoe is that you put your foot in it. The important thing about an apple is that it's round. The important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. But it's also not exactly fiction either, right? I mean, it's not like she's telling a story. It's not as though these are lies, per se, of friend of mine in grad school, he never read fiction, ever. Never read novels, short stories, none of that stuff. Shrapi likes that stuff. Shrapi would rather read that, quite honestly, than a lot of philosophy. And, he was, and so I asked him, I was like, when was the last time you read any fiction? He said, you mean lies? I mean, stories are necessarily lies. Right? B for vendetta. Um, what does he talk about in there about there's a difference between lies that lead to the truth and lies that conceal the truth. But that's poli sci, not intro to philosophy necessarily. And I wonder, right? So she says the important thing about grass is that it's green. So in the winter here in Columbus, when it turns brown, it's no longer grass. It's something else at that point. But my favorite one in the whole book is the one at the beginning, the spoon. So, whack job crazy Dr. Shroppy. Here's another thing that Dr. Shroppy does in his spare time. Is he goes to elementary schools and does half an hour of philosophy with the kids. Usually third, fourth, or fifth graders, depending on the school and depending on the particular class. And so I read the important book. And we discuss spoons. And it's interesting because she says a spoon is like a little shovel. What is the difference between a spoon and a shovel? Is it size? And my, my daughter has dolls that have shovels. But are those shovels then actually spoons because of the size? Is it the shape? I mean, she says, right? She says the spoons are hollow. They're not flat. Have you ever been to Orange Leaf? And so usually, no, I forgot to, I don't have one with me today, but typically I have a spoon from Orange Leaf, the orange ones. They look very flat at the end. They also look rectangular at the end instead of round, which is what you typically expect from a spoon. Is Orange Leaf providing us free spoons or are they providing us free tiny shovels? Or are they providing us something else? Right, should I, next time I go to Orange Leaf, which who knows when that'll be, next time I go to Orange Leaf, should I say, excuse me, where are the spoons? Because the end of this is not hollow. It's not round. They'd look at me like I was crazy. What's the difference between a spoon and a shovel? Is there a difference? Does it come down to function? Margaret Wise Brown says, the important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. Okay. So I go to my kitchen drawer, I take out what up until now we would call a spoon. And I use a deed ice cream. Spoon, bam, fulfilling its function, awesome. But what if, instead of eating ice cream with it, I take it out to dig in the dirt 
Is it suddenly now not a spoon? Because I'm not using it to eat ice cream. I'm not using it to eat food, therefore it's no longer a spoon. It's now suddenly become a shovel. Huh. Who knew what is a spoon was such a deep philosophical question, right? My brother-in-law, years ago, we were he was living with us for a short time, and he needed a snake. He was going to snake one of the drains. So he took a hanger, a metal hanger, and untwisted it and turned it into a snake. And I, you know, just flippantly, but knew it would lead to something, a deeper discussion, said, now when did the hanger become a snake? Was, was the hanger always a snake? They just happen to be functioning as a hanger? Is it still a hanger that you just happen to be using as a snake? Is it both at the same time? It's hanger and snake? Was it a hanger until you started untwisting it? Was it a hanger until you finished untwisting it? When does one thing become something else? Because what that does is it forces you to ask yourself, what's the essential thing about this? Another one of the videos I have up from another class, different context, is about personhood. And really it's sort of about that. What's the essential characteristic or quality of personhood? What is it that makes a person a person that separates a person from everything else? That's an interesting question. An interesting movie based upon the short story by Centennial Man, the short story written by Isaac Asimov, the movie starring Robin Williams, and the movie is not a great movie. I'm not recommending it to you because it's a great movie. I'm recommending it to you because it raises this question. It starts off with a robot. If you don't like sci-fi, fine, whatever. It starts off with a robot who creates something artistic. What? Robots aren't supposed to do that. Robots typically aren't free, creative thinkers. They do what they're told to do. They don't decide for themselves, I'm going to make a horse out of this just because I feel like it or something along those lines. Mm. So clearly this robot's broken, it's defective. Or maybe it's not really a robot. I think it's actually a person. And there are three or four major transformations that occur throughout this film that really force you, the viewer, to ask yourself, whoa, is this robot a person now? Ooh, is this robot a person now? If at any point you say yes, then that indicates that's the moment. That's the thing that you consider to be essential. The fact it has flesh, the fact that it has internal organs and can therefore die, the fact it creates art, the fact it can love, whatever it is. is an indication to you, the viewer, ah, this is what I consider to be the essential characteristic or quality or property of person which may be very different than the person you're watching the movie with. From Aristotle's perspective, you're neither one wrong. You just disagree. You have differing opinions, and that's it. But notice, the other thing that this does then, is it removes the possibility for there to be a good work of art. All art then is stuff that people like and stuff that people don't like. We're stuck back with the ice cream. I like chocolate ice cream. How about you? And that's what every discussion boils down to because that's all there is is just opinion. Hmm. Hmm. Now I get to think about spoons and shovels, hopefully. All right. So let's go to the excerpt a little bit. Let's get into the text here. Um, in the beginning here, he's talking about primary and secondary substances. Okay. Now, primary substances are individual subjects. They're individual things, individual people, individual cars. Again, this power in the particular. Okay. Um, and then secondary substance would be like one step removed from that. So for example, instead of a species, it's a genus instead. So a secondary substance would be vehicle. The primary substance would be crossover or something along those lines. And actually, technically, that's not correct either. Really, the secondary substance would be crossover. The tertiary would be vehicle. The primary would be that one. Primary substance is always that. 
that particular, that particular subject, that, 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 that. You can point to it. It's point outable. You can pick it out of a lineup based upon its characteristics. Now, those essential characteristics are things that it's going to share with others. That's where it's going to make it a species. Right? The species of humankind or something along those lines. The species of people who wear glasses. The species of people who are bald. The species, species, species. That's going to be a secondary substance. The primary is going to be that one. That I can pick out of a police lineup. And he says, look, technically we could talk about tertiary substance and all that. We're just going to talk about secondary. So primary is the individual. Secondary is the species. Secondary is also the genus and the phylum and all that stuff in the class and all that. All that's also secondary. Technically, we could get into tertiary and all that. Just get a little secondary. Okay. So we got secondary and primary. And again, the importance is the primary. This is why his is a bottom-up philosophy instead of a top-down philosophy. Remember, Plato's pointing up because it all comes down from the forms. We ascend, we're moving our way up, but once we get to the top, we realize, oh, hey, this is where it's at. Everything else falls underneath. Aristotle's the opposite. It starts down here. It's grassroots. Again, the egalitarian stuff, the democracy stuff. It's grassroots which bring about change. It's down here. It's the stuff you can touch and taste and feel and all that. Touch and feel are the same things. You know what I mean. That's where reality is. We shouldn't try to transcend the senses. The senses are the best access we have to reality. The senses are the best access we have to anything. The senses are the first step, yes, but there's not much beyond that first step. We experience things through the world of the senses. We connect it up with previous things that we've sensorily experienced. Bam, there you go. That's the end. Those things then prepare us for other things that we will experience, right? Oh, hey, there's another table. Oh, wow, now expecting to walk into a room and see chairs. Let me grab a drink, sorry. It's based on these previous sensory experiences. That's it. That's what it all boils down to. So you have these primary and secondary substances, and he's gonna talk more about primary substances towards the end. Let me skip there now, actually. And this is related to the essential accidental quality stuff. So accidental qualities are just all the other things. Okay. So an accidental quality, this tie. I don't have to wear a tie. You would recognize me even if I didn't wear a tie. Right? You would recognize me if I didn't have a belt on. You'd recognize me if I didn't have my glasses. You're not like, whoa, wait, where did Dr. Shroppy go? Who's this new guy? No, no, no. You know it's still me. This is an accidental quality, not essential. I haven't essentially changed. I'm not somebody different when I remove the glasses. Which can I just say, I'm, I'm, I wonder about the investigative reporting of the Daily Planet. If they couldn't figure out, this is Superman, this is Clark Kent, oh my goodness, wow, how'd that happen? Then how can they dig into any story believably? Then The Tick does a fantastic job making fun of this, if you've read The Tick comics. Um, he wears a tie and changes nothing else, and no one recognizes him. That's great. Um, right, so the essential and accidental. Right Now, there are certain aspects about me that even though we haven't actually met face-to-face, -face, if, um, if in my next, I uh, guess I'll call this a lecture, although I don't even like that word, but whatever, in my next thing, right, if I just pulled up a chair and sat in front of the screen... Never raised my voice. Didn't talk with my hands at all. I could still have on the shirt and the tie and the glasses. But you'd wonder, what the heck happened to Dr. Shrappy? This is not the teacher that we've come to know over the past few weeks. Something is different. Something has essentially changed. Maybe this is his twin brother or something. That something's different, something's off. This isn't him. He's acting out of character. Back to the character and self stuff. Character, what, again, what everyone else sees. Everyone else defines it for you. You are this. Mm. So essential, accidental. That also has to do with the primary substances as well. Other things having to do with primary substance. So every substance of the primary type 
signify a certain this. That's what I was indicating before. You can point to it and take it out of a lineup. You know exactly which one it is, right? If you give, if you give an exhaustive enough list of descriptors about Dr. Shrapi, I'm the only one who meets all of them. And there are tons of philosophy profs, tons of straight white guys, tons of 40-somethings, tons of folks who are married with three kids, tons of folks who might meet all of those things. Tons of folks who may, might meet all those things and teach philosophy courses. Tons of folks who might meet all of those and teach philosophy courses and wear glasses. I don't know. But eventually we're going to get to a list of characteristics that only I meet. So again, line up of all people. Right? You start narrowing based upon these qualities. Narrow, 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 narrow. Eventually, based upon these characteristics, there's only one left. That's me. Point outable. Different from everyone else. Unique in some way. It signifies a certainness. Another characteristic of substances is that there is nothing contrary to them. For what could be contrary to a primary substance? And there's this phrase, opposites attract. That's stupid. I don't even know what that means. There's no opposite to me. I don't, I don't have an opposite. Even in a bizarro world or an evil twin world, that person wouldn't be the opposite of me. They'd actually be very, very similar to me. Apples and oranges aren't opposites. They're extremely similar. That's what brings the few differences to the forefront. Right? Complete opposites would be things like um, pink and four. No, wait, they both have four letters. Pink and six. No, they both have eyes. Um... Uh, Pink and 17. Nothing at all in common, I don't think. There might be. They both have a letter N, but yeah, okay. Completely different things. Have nothing to do with one another. Opposites. There's no opposite to an individual. There's, when you go to the zoo, there's no opposite to that giraffe. All the giraffes are pretty similar. Are there differences? Of course. Can they pick each other out of a lineup? I presume so, right? Apparently the spots on them are like fingerprints that are unique. Great. But there's no opposite to a particular giraffe. There's no opposite to a particular person. There's no opposite. It's not the way opposites work. There are people who are different than in certain ways and the same in other ways. Hmm. Opposite to a person? Uh -huh. Now, typically, I think what that means, opposites attract, is opposite interests, right? Differing opinions about life, I guess, right? So you have some right-wing nut job and some left-wing nut job, and I guess they're attracted to each other because they're on differing poles politically and ideologically. Okay. Or, you know, some city mouse, country mouse thing or something. Okay. But even though they're not opposites, different experiences, not opposites. Substance does not admit of a more or a less. I'm not more me today than I was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I'm not more me. I'm different than. I'm not more than. I'm not... <clears throat> someone who grills meat. Oh, ooh, ooh, even better. Someone who goes out, hunts their own meat, field dresses their meat, cooks their meat, and eats their meat. Are they more man than I am who doesn't do any of those things? Or is this just different than? Mm. More or less. More or less individual. More me today than I was yesterday. There may be more of me today than there was yesterday. Actually, slightly less today than there was yesterday. There's more of me now than there was when the pandemic started. Working on it, but I hurt my hamstrings and I can't run. It's a, it's a whole thing. <clears throat> okay. One man, this is quoting Aristotle about him on page 78. One man is not more a man than another. If they meet the essential characteristics, they meet the essential characteristics. There's not a more and a less. A more and a less, again, presumes that there's some type of ideal form that it's getting closer or further away from. That's not the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm 
<laughs> yeah, you need to get on that. On that part. Okay. And again, to emphasize this importance of individual. Um, I need to get my eraser. To erase this, I'm gonna start over. He talks about subjects and predicates. And he's using Greek language rather than English, but I don't know Greek, so I'm gonna use English. <clears throat> he's talking about, again, subjects. And so this grammar lesson he's giving us here really is indicative of his metaphysical lesson he's trying to get across as well. All right. So he's going to talk about Bucephalus is strong. Right. Bucephalus is Alexander the Great's war horse. This is a complete sentence. Bucephalus is strong. Right. Now I'm going to write two potential complete sentences. Again, I'm using English, not Greek, but the idea still comes across. Bucephalus is, is strong. Are either of those complete sentences? I'll pause so you can think about it a moment. The answer is yes. One of them is a complete sentence. Bucephalus is. That is a complete sentence. There's a subject, and there's a verb. Bam, that's all you need. Look how important the subject is. Down here is strong. I've got a verb and I've got a predicate. That's not a sentence. I have no subject. <gasps> what? Look, to have a complete sentence, you need a subject. The subject's the important part of the sentence. What the sentence is about. It's the whole point of the sentence is the subject. Just like metaphysics, it's the individual particular subject that's important. The subject is the one determining things. The subject is the one being creative and self-creating and so on and so forth, changing society, blah, blah, blah. Forcing others to think more critically and more deeply about things by questioning the way things have always been done. Well, what about this part of society? What about this part of gender roles? What about, what about, what about? And the whole point of critical thinking at all is self-actualization. Actualization for this subject right here. Back to Maslow's hierarchy of basic needs. Self-actualization at the top. Other times that's, ta that's referenced as happiness. Just below that is things like friends. And Aristotle writes a ton about friends and friendship. A ton. Because he also thinks it's essential for true subjecthood. For actual actualization of the subject. The important part of life here. Not that I completely dismiss everything else. We are social animals, says Aristotle which is why society matters so greatly. We are embedded in a society. Again, Heidegger kind of taking some of these ideas from Aristotle and thrown into a world with others and blah, blah, blah. We're social animals. Oh, wow, that's a social animal self-actualization. I just noticed that, that's pretty cool. So we're social animals and the rest of society then does impact us. Remember, they're the ones that define our character and may influence our character he says that parenthood is the most important job that there is because you're helping at an early age the self-actualization thing to potentially take place down the road. The 13-year-old has to be prepared in order to be able to make decisions on their own through those first 13 years of the parents making good decisions for them and habit building and so on and so forth. For more on that part of the story, take my intro to ethics class. We spent about a week and a half on Aristotle's virtue ethics, which really is based on a lot of this same stuff. Is strong not a sentence? Strong is meaningless unless you have a subject that is actually strong. If nothing out there is strong, strong loses its meaning. It doesn't mean anything. 
You have to have individual particulars who have that predicate in order for the predicate to have meaning. Socrates is bald. Great. We only care because bald helps to pick out Socrates. But if Socrates isn't bald and no one else is bald either, then there is no such thing as bald. That concept ceases to exist. The exact opposite of Plato, right? For Plato, it's not about the individual. It's about the thing out there, the object of truth. So he would have to say, no, 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 there is the concept of strong, the form of strong, form and concept, different though related. There's a form of strong out there, even if there isn't anything that closely adheres to it. Says Plato, Aristotle completely disagrees, completely disagrees. <laughs> yeah, so Socrates is bald. This is the footnote on page 76, basically explaining what I've just explained here. Page 77, all other things are either said of the primary substances as subjects or in them as subjects. For example, animal is predicated of man and therefore also the individual man. What? Okay. So if we were to say that man is animal, right? We're talking about humankind here. Man is animal, which is true. Right? Man is part of the larger species, the larger class of animal, right? <laughs> so then we could say that David is also animal, right? Because I'm an individual particular, part of this class, which is part of this class. So David is animal. It is true, not particularly helpful. Can't pick David out of a lineup by saying David's an animal. I might have a crab next to me. That's also an animal, so it's not helpful. I need something more descriptive. It's true, but not as descriptive as it could be or should be in order to pick out of a lineup. <clears throat> animal is predicated of man. Animal is predicated of man. Man's the subject here. Um, yeah. Again, color is in body and therefore also in an individual body. For were it not in some individual body, it would not be in body at all, and therefore cease to exist as a concept. Thus, all the other things are either said of the primary substances as subjects or in them as subjects. Of the secondary substances, the species is more a substance than the genus. Oh, the kingdom phylum genus thing, right? Species is closer to the individual than genus is. Okay. Since it's nearer to the primary substance. It's more informative to say that the individual man, that he is a man, than that he is an animal, since the one is more distinctive of the individual man while the other is more general. In the bottom 77 is where he start, start, sort of talks about these subconscious stereotype things. Uh, man is not in individual man. Animal is not in the individual man. But actually, it's better in the footnote from part one. I'm referencing part two here. Hopefully, that's obvious. Um, in the footnote on page, page is this, 20? No, it's actually not the footnote, it's the very bottom of page 20. Although what one perceives is the particular thing. So again, this is like Plato's ordinary objects. That's perception. Perception is senses plus mind. Aristotle here, again, he agrees there's senses plus mind, just nothing beyond that. Although what one perceives is the particular thing the perception is of a universal. For example, of a man, not of Callias. So really, when you have experiences, what you're doing is you're experiencing multiple things at the same time. You're experiencing things on multiple levels. You're experiencing your friend as your friend, but you're also experiencing them as your friend from Burkina Faso. And you're also experiencing them as someone from Burkina Faso. This is all happening. The mind is an amazing, amazing thing. Aristotle is starting to get to that, right? Aristotle, in some ways, is sort of laying the groundwork for psychology to come, again, about 2,000 years later. Yeah, right? He's laying the groundwork. He's like, whoa, let's figure out this mind thing, because this is pretty amazing. We abstract out of experience. We attach names to things, which then help us to have future experiences of similar things. That's nutso. That's crazy. 
Really, we should just experience things as, hey, experience, wow, awesome. Whoa, experience, wow, awesome. But we don't. We don't. We connect things together. We want to build concepts and group things together in file folders. I don't know about you, but me at least, if I have a bunch of like random things on my desktop, it kind of drives me a little crazy. I want to be able to categorize, to put them together with like things. To have a cleaner desktop. To have a cleaner desktop. If you can categorize things, right? It makes it a lot easier then for things like conversation too. Conversations are based upon presumptions. If you meet someone from Brazil, you can in all likelihood talk about soccer with them. Not all of them. I know the one Brazilian who does not like soccer and never has. His name's Flavio. Doesn't care about soccer. He's an anomaly even to my other Brazilian friends. They don't understand it either. They point out, yeah, he's the one in the whole country who doesn't care about soccer. He's the one. Right? But it gives you, right, conversations, again, are based on presumptions. And so when you begin a conversation with someone, you're, you're already coming at it with them representing something else. Again, this is not judging them based upon that. Judging is different than presuming. Judging is different than presuming. Very different, right? And it takes a whole different tenor and tone with regards to the conversation as well, right? A presumption, wow, you're really tall. I wonder, did you happen to play basketball? Wow, you're from Brazil. Do you like soccer? Right, the question itself already presumes a particular answer. The main thing here, Aristotle wants to focus much more on each individual subject and in particular. For Plato, the particulars are there in place only to lead to the universals. The reverse for Aristotle. The universals are there just to help frame conceptually your next experience of a particular. Critical thinking, right? For Plato, is all about ascending. It's all about getting the soul to understand and perceive. For Aristotle, critical thinking is about self-actualization. Again, it's about the subject. Truth with a big old capital T for Plato is out there. For Aristotle, it's not. It's subjective majority opinion. They completely disagree about very, very fundamental things of philosophy. Yeah. And so for next time then, um, and I'm still running with the idea of truth is kind of the undercurrent here of this part, right? Knowledge as justified true belief. I'm focusing right on the truth thing. Plato represents objective truth. Aristotle represents subjective truth. Now what's interesting is that in the future from these guys like now, Aristotle was the one who was the scientist. Plato is the one who gave us a story, right? But Plato is the one about objective truth. Aristotle is the one about subjective truth. Somewhere along the lines, these things got flipped around. That now many people presume art to be about subjective truth and science to be about objective truth. Next time I'll bring some articles and so forth and reference them and read some to you from them about what this post-truth era looks like or exemplifies and how, if at all, that might play into what Plato and Aristotle wrote about. All right, that's it for this one. See you next time.